So um, our first speaker today is William Boltz, who's a professor of Asian languages and literatures at the University of Washington. He's an expert in the history of writing in China and perhaps most well known for his book, The Origin and Early Development of the Chinese Writing System, published in 1994 and reprinted in 2003. Um, that book traces the emergence of Chinese writing over the first millennium of its development. Professor Boltz's work on the origin and development of Chinese is one dimension of his broad expertise in early Chinese language and writing that has resulted in publications about orthographic variation and historical phonology, textual criticism, and myth. He's currently affiliated with the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, where he's working on a collaborative project about, the theoretic, about theoretical knowledge in the Moist Canon, a Chinese philosophical work written circa 300 BC. Um, and with the Encyclopedia of Manuscript Culture in Asia and Africa at the Center for the Study of Manuscript Cultures at the University of Hamburg. His work is well known for being at once expert in its handling of the specificities of Chinese writing and language while placing these developments in a broad comparative framework. We're thrilled to have him speaking to us today and opening our discussion about the origins of writing. His lecture this morning is entitled, The Emergence of Writing in Antiquity, Monog mono now I need to say it, monogenesis or polygenesis. I don't know why I stumbled over that. Professor Boltz, please uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very nice introduction, very generous. And now I have about 45 minutes to stumble over it myself. Um, I think the first thing I need to do is to share the screen so you can see my slides. So let me see if it's going to work this way. Now, can in, is, is it working? Is this is this um, now visible on the on the screen for everybody? It is wonderful. Okay, well, thank you again, uh, Professor Nakasis, for that nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be back in Boulder, even if only virtually. And um, uh, I will apologize for the smoke that uh, affected Boulder coming from over here on the West Coast, but I can assure you. It's been a lot worse here than it has there. Uh, in any case, um, uh, it's given me an opportunity to stay inside and think about this question, since it's impossible to go outside and breathe the dangerously hazardous air. <clears throat> so let me start with a few things uh, that are known to everybody here, and yet they sort of set the, set the uh, stage for what I want to talk about. And the first thing that I, uh, that I would like to, to remind you is that all writing systems in the modern world have developed um, uh, one way or another, ultimately either from uh, Egyptian or from, or from Chinese. Now, for some reason, this doesn't change. Let's see there. <clears throat> either from this, from Chinese, uh, or from Egyptian. If the, uh, if the question were which one of these two writing systems um, provided um, birth, gave birth to more, which one of these ancient cultures, I probably should say, gave birth to more writing systems uh, than the other, then the Egyptians would win hands down by a score of about 10 to 1. Uh, except for the writing systems of Asia, namely China, Korea, and Japan, all writing systems in the modern world, I'm just talking about the origin of writing systems that are used in the modern world. I'm not talking about the, the numerous um, ancient and now, and now obsolete and a lot of undeciphered writing systems. That's a different story. I'm just talking about writing systems that everybody is familiar with somewhere in the world today, uh, everyday writing systems. So the, uh, the writing systems that have originated from Egyptian are maybe 10 times more numerous than the writing systems that have originated from Chinese. Um, <clears throat> if the contest instead were which of these two ancient cultures has provided writing to more people in the modern world than the other, then Egypt still wins, but now only by about four to one. So glottographic writing, that is writing that represents the sounds of the language it writes, uh, 
however imperfectly, emerged four times in antiquity. In addition to the Egyptian and Chinese cases, uh, it also was invented, as you all know, of course, in Mesopotamia and Mesoamerica. Uh, as important and interesting as the Mesopotamian and Mesoamerican cases are, historically, culturally, linguistically, and in, in, in a myriad of ways, neither of them gave rise to anything that has survived as a functioning everyday writing system in the modern world. <clears throat> now, based on appearances uh, of the scripts themselves, each of these four would seem to be unrelated to the others and thus to have arisen independently. If that were the end of the story, then we could all vote for polygenesis and my assignment would be done and we could adjourn and have a free hour for coffee. But as you know, it's not the end of the story. Given the fact that the archeological record indicates that writing first appears in Mesopotamia and in Egypt at virtually the same time, and in view of the geographical proximity of these two areas to each other, there's naturally a reasonable suspicion that the invention of writing in one influenced the invention of writing in the other. For a long time, the archeological record seemed to show evidence for writing slightly earlier in Mesopotamia than in Egypt, and therefore the conclusion was that the so-called first true writing <clears throat> uh, was Mesopotamian, and writing in Egypt was one way or another the result of uh, a Mesopotamian influence. This conclusion is now less certain than it used to be because more recent archaeological investigations, if I'm not mistaken, show evidence for writing in both places at the same time. Neither one can be pinpointed as earlier than the other. When you look at the graphs and signs of the actual writing systems, <clears throat> then there's nothing that would suggest one is borrowed or derived from the other. The compromise conclusion to this situation is often something along the lines of saying that the idea of writing, and the idea of writing is usually put in scare quotes like that. I don't generally do this kind of thing, but if I did do it, I would say the idea of writing that way. Uh, must have passed from one of these two places to the other, though in which direction is not clear, and the actual writing systems are in their graphic form, each independent of the other. So whether this is monogenesis or polygenesis uh, becomes a matter of definition. And in any case, this is not the question that I have set myself to answer, chiefly because I have no expertise in either Mesopotamian cuneiform or Egyptian hieroglyphic writing or in their historical backgrounds. Monogenesis comprehensively understood refers to the thesis of a single origin of writing universally, that is worldwide. In other words, can all four instances of the emergence of writing in antiquity, that's Egypt, Mesopotamia, China and Mesoamerica be the result ultimately of a single origin. <clears throat> the question is interesting because if they are, then we have only to explain where writing uh, came from and how it emerged once. But if they are not, that is if it's a matter of, uh, of polygenesis, multiple origins, then we have the more interesting situation that the late Bruce Trigger talked about why in one place and not in another. What was it about those places where writing uh, emerged and what were the similarities and what were the differences, assuming independent origins, and how do we account for that? <clears throat> so it becomes an interesting question in this respect. Uh, one of the first scholars to raise this question from a scientific perspective was the 20th century uh, Polish Assyriologist Ignace J. Gelb. Gelb included as the penultimate section of his classic book, A Study of Writing, a chapter called Monogenesis or Polygenesis of Writing. And even though his work is now nearly 70 years old, he still gets credit, I think, for being one of the first scholars 
to take a serious analytical and comprehensive approach to this question. Gelb distinguishes what he calls the comparison of outer forms of individual signs from the comparison of inner characteristics. By the former, he means simply uh, comparing the shapes and appearances of graphs in one writing system with shapes and appearances of graphs in another in an effort to identify connections among them. Because such comparisons are based on nothing more than superficial visual shapes of what are typically graphically very simple signs, the enterprise is an undertaking that Gelb deems doomed to failure. By comparison of inner characteristics, on the other hand, Gelb means comparisons of internal structural features of writing systems, such as what he refers to as phoneticization and vocalization. By referring to these things as inner characteristics of writing, Gelb is referring to the ways in which they are reflected in writing systems, and this leads us to one of the basic defining features of writing, at least the kind of writing um, to which the question of polygenesis or monogenesis primarily pertains and that I want to deal with here. Writing reflects the sounds of language. It is, in other words, glottographic. To be sure, no writing system reflects the sounds of the language it writes perfectly, and every writing system includes things that uh, reflect features of the language beyond simple sounds. All the same, there's a fundamental distinction between glottographic writing and non-glottographic marking systems. The latter are sometimes lumped together under the label semasiographic writing, but this is not a particularly useful label since there are probably as many different kinds of semasiographic writing systems as there are different kinds of Plato's barbarians. The only thing that defines a barbarian is that he's not Greek. The, in the same way, the only thing that defines a semasiographic writing system is that it's not glottographic. That leaves it fairly vague and not a particularly meaningful label. Now, let me at this point quickly add a note to say that in restricting my remarks to glottographic writing and saying that writing reflects language, by no means do I intend to suggest that writing understood broadly has always to be limited to this definition. There are innumerable important linguistic and semiotic aspects of sign systems beyond the glottographic that bear on the study of writing broadly, uh, broadly defined from a number of different perspectives. Uh, tomorrow's scheduled presentation by Professor Klin Daniel on the Inca Kipu promises to be a good example of this. But for the purpose of talking about the origin of writing ex nihilo, especially from a comparative perspective, it makes sense to deal specifically with glottographic writing. In this way, we are comparing genuinely comparable things. Writing consists of graphic signs, that is visible written graphs. So these we will call capital G. Any graph that functions as writing broadly understood, whether glottographic or non-glottographic, will have by definition some conventionally associated semantic import understood by the community of users. We may say in other words, that it has a semantic value uh, otherwise, it's simply an ad hoc transient marking uh, or a meaningless scribble of some kind. We can formally designate this, as I've shown here on this slide, as either plus s or minus s uh, with a semantic value or having no semantic value. A graph that does not convey any conventionally understood meaning, that is, has no semantic value, and I have to emphasize for the purposes of writing systems or any kind of sign system, we have to uh, specify conventionally understood because in order to be useful, it has to have the same meaning for all of the people who use the system. Otherwise it becomes uh, not very useful. So a graph that has no semantic value is thus minus S and because it has no established meaning, it won't constitute an element in any kind of a notational system. <clears throat> 
apart from whether a graph has a semantic value or not, it also may or may not have a phonetic value. When it does, uh, we mark it as plus p. When it does not, we mark it as minus p. The lingu linguistic level of the p value in this formulation is irrelevant. Uh, it has nothing to do with the definition of being plus or minus p. The pronunciation of the graph can be at the level of a single sound, for example, the b sound in boulder. It can be a syllabic sound as the b sound in barbecue. It can be uh, uh, a complete morpheme uh, as the b in before when you write it the way I've shown it there. Or it can be a complete lexical item as the b in beehive uh, in the phrase beehive when you write it the way I've shown it here. The level uh, of the phonetic value doesn't matter. Different writing systems use graphs at different phonetic levels, and, um, uh, and that doesn't change the fact that the graph is, is glottographic. The salient point is to distinguish between graphs that have some conventionally associated phonetic value and those that do not. Between, in other words, what we can call glottographic writing and non-glottographic writing. This is irrespective of the level uh, at which the glottographic element is operating. The features S and P thus constitute two independent binary variables, which taken together describe a graph with respect to both meaning and pronunciation. This gives us a four-way uh, set of distinctions. You can see it right here. It's very simple, straightforward, and, and I'm sure this will come as as astonishing news to anybody. Um, what I call type one here is, is simply a graph that has no uh, established phonetic value or semantic value, and therefore it's not writing of any kind um, and, and doesn't pertain to the question of writing systems. The second one certainly does. This is the uh, set of graphs that have semantic values, but no established phonetic value. So these are what I uh, called uh, and dismissed somewhat, somewhat uh, ex cathedra a minute ago, uh, semasiographic systems, that is they're non-glottographic marking systems and they're, they're certainly important to be sure, um, but they don't count as glottographic writing, but they certainly can count as writing uh, in a broadly defined notion of writing, nothing wrong with that. The third and the fourth are the two that are basically glottographic, they're both plus P, in the third case, the, the, the graphs, the individual graphs have a semantic value. Simply put, that means they either write words or morphemes. In the fourth case, uh, they don't have the, the graphs for the most part don't have uh, uh, semantic values. And therefore they write what you would call syllables or as in Japanese, for example, or letters in an alphabet. So this is a, a fairly simple, straightforward four-way distinction based on these two features. So of the four, uh, three of them can be considered writing, writing broadly understood, and the last two constitute glottographic writing. When we speak of the origin of writing systems, it's glottographic writing uh, with which we're going to be concerned. Though non-glottographic sign systems likely played an important role in the emergence of glottographic writing. We commonly talk about the invention of writing in antiquity ex nihilo, meaning that there were no pre-existing or coexisting writing systems uh, that had any bearing on the invention of the writing uh, system in question. But in all probability, it was really not an ex nihilo phenomenon. Writing seems to have emerged from the phoneticization of graphs in a non-glottographic marking system of some kind. The archaeological records of both Egypt and Mesopotamia show what seem to be non-glottographic marking systems, that is, sign systems, where the signs themselves cannot always be confidently associated with any fixed phonetic values, but that look clearly like they have some meaning uh, in a structured graphic system that could have readily given rise to glottographic writing. In Mesopotamia, these are the uh, Uruk IV period, so-called proto-cuneiform texts. Here is a simple example that I've plagiarized from somebody's book. I don't remember where. Uh, 
there is still, I think, uh, considerable uncertainty about the extent to which the graphs on many of the protocuneiform tablets are either plus p or minus p. That is, whether they have established conventional pronunciations or not. If they do, then they are being used to write words. And if they don't, they're still writing words. But now we have to put the words in these things, scare quotes, <clears throat> because there's no fixed lexical association for them. They're functioning in the aggregate as a non-glottographic marking signs system. There is, as you probably know, considerable diversity of opinion on whether the graphs of the protocuneiform tablets constitute glottographic writing or not. But there's no doubt that they are the direct precursors to fully glottographic cuneiform writing. The situation in Egypt is a little less clear cut. The kinds of signs shown here are representative of one group of a large number of signs found on small uh, bone or ivory tags. Each one of these is about one or two square centimeters in size. They come from a tomb in Upper Egypt at Abydos or Abydos um, and are a century or two earlier than the earliest recognized Egyptian writing. The current opinion among Egyptologists is that they were mass produced for funerals and probably attached to grave objects. Uh, that presumably accounts for the tiny holes in the uh, upper corner uh, of all of these. The tags on the left side of this slide uh, show marks that are taken to write numbers. And the ones on the right now show mostly iconographically discernible signs, one or two per tag. None of those signs is unambiguously identifiable with an Egyptian hieroglyphic sign, much less with any word. But everyone recognizes an apparent strong stylistic and structural similarity to hieroglyphic writing. It's this that leads the Egyptologists to see these as a kind of precursor to hier hieroglyphic writing comparable uh, in some respects to the protocuneiform signs in Mesopotamia. Both the Mesopotamian protocuneiform signs and the Egyptian protohieroglyphic signs are clearly used in a structured systemic way. They constitute, in other words, some kind of meaningful graphic marking system. Uh, and in both cases, it seems likely that these marking systems led to writing with uh, which sign uh, and under what specific usages this happened is not known. But the theoretical point is clear. A sign that was used as a part of a graphic marking system uh, with a lexical meaning corresponding to the meaning that the sign had in its earlier usage had become phoneticized. The pronunciation becomes fixed and conventionally associated with that sign among the community of users. The meaning becomes fixed uh, with the um, <clears throat> meaning that the sign had in the pre-glottographic usage in its precursor form, and then it becomes the written form for that word in the language. The turning point is the development from non-phonetic to phonetic. This is called phoneticization and if we wanted to give it a kind of dramatic flair, we can say that this marks the birth of writing. To be sure, it's not necessary, and it's even very unlikely, that all of the graphs in a precursor non-glottographic marking system were phoneticized at the same time. In all likelihood, this was a gradual process, graph by graph or category of graph by category of graph. Numbers, uh, proper names, names of commodities, things like that. Uh, although it's still debated how many and which of the protocuneiform signs are plus p, that is, which ones stand phonetically for specific words and which don't, and it's still very uncertain whether any of the Egyptian uh, proto hieroglyphic signs were plus p or not, and it uh, uh, all the same. The theoretical picture is both clear and straightforward. The archaeological record in both cases shows an ideal setting for the phoneticization of signs giving birth to glottographic writing. The Chinese case is much less satisfying. 
There's nothing in the archeological record in China that corresponds to the proto-hieroglyphic signs in Egypt or to the proto-cuneiform signs in Mesopotamia. The earliest identifiable Chinese writing is the script found on the so-called Shang period oracle bone inscriptions. And oracle bone is another one of those phrases for which I would go this way if I were inclined to do that because it, because, uh, it doesn't really describe very effectively what they were, but it's the name that has become conventional in the popular literature for early Chinese uh, inscribed pieces. So here's a nice example. Uh, this is a turtle plastron. Uh, this is the side in which most of the text is, is written. You can see text written on the, on the sides like this. Um, there's a very interesting symmetry to it. There are all kinds of interesting things to say about it. If, if I wanted to try to talk about the power and authority aspect of the conference instead of simply the origins of writing aspect, this would be the starting point for that discussion in China. But uh, that's a different, a different question that I will leave aside uh, for the moment. This is the backside of the same plastron. And you can see there's a little bit of writing uh, on the left-hand side over here, but the salient feature of the backside are these symmetrically marked uh, white spots, which are actually pits that have been gouged out of the uh, out of the surface of, of the shell in order to make it thin, so that when heat was applied at those spots, it would be thin enough to crack. Uh, that was the divinatory, the, the central part of the divinatory process uh, for which these things were were used. Um, the earliest of these inscriptions. Uh, date from about 1200 BC. That's fully two millennia later than the earliest writing in Egypt uh, and Mesopotamia. Unlike the earliest Egyptian and Mesopotamian written texts, these Chinese texts show a fully developed writing system writing grammatically complete sentences. This presupposes a developmental period comparable to the period let's say between the proto-cuneiform or proto-hieroglyphic sign systems of Mesopotamia and Egypt and their fully developed writing systems. But for China, there's no such archeological evidence. There, there's no indication, there's no archeological indication of that kind um, of development. <clears throat> so uh, uh, that absence together with the fact that Chinese writing first shows up 2,000 years later than writing in Egypt uh, and Mesopotamia provides the opening for the claim that Chinese writing was ultimately the result of influences from writing in the ancient Near East. This is usually referred to as stimulus diffusion. The claim is that somehow the concept or idea of writing was passed from the ancient Near East that means from here, um, and it served as a stimulus for the invention of writing here. The time difference between the two is uh, as much as 2,000 years. The earliest Chinese writing, these uh, so-called oracle bone inscriptions of the late Shang, all are found at a single archaeological site called Anyang, uh, this is marked with the red X on my slide, the China slide, uh, the China side of the slide that you see there. The central white space between ancient Mesopotamia of about 3000 BC and uh, on the left and ancient China of about 1200 BC on the right, the white space in the middle represents everything that is known about the ostensible diffusion process of the concept of writing from uh, west to east, from near east to far east. Implicit in the journey across Central Asia, taking a millennium or more without leaving a trace, um, is the assumption that writing somehow survived and provoked the invention of writing in China. Uh, this, in my view, is a somewhat improbable scenario, chiefly because there's no evidence for any kind of contact that has anything to do with writing. On that basis alone, I would say that the default hypothesis 
has to be that Chinese writing was invented independently of writing anywhere else. If some kind of concrete archaeological evidence turned up that showed a connection between Chinese writing and writing in the ancient Near East, that would of course change the picture. But so far that hasn't happened. Apart from a general skepticism about the stimulus diffusion claim, there's a more specific basis for being skeptical. As I mentioned, Chinese writing is known no earlier than around 1200 BC. If writing from the ancient Near East is responsible for the invention of writing <clears throat> in China, it would mean that there was no development of writing in China from any kind of indigenous precursor, non-glottographic sign system. And that implication is consistent with the fact that the earliest Chinese writing known is found in a form already uh, writing grammatically, syntactically complete sentences, something that took a few centuries to achieve in both Egypt and Mesopotamia. But it also means that what we find in China represents directly the impact of the hypothesized stimulus from the ancient Near East. So one approach to judging the likelihood of the stimulus diffusion claim is to consider whether Chinese writing of around 1200 BC looks like it could have been the result of an influence of writing from the ancient Near East around that time. Since we're dealing with a hypothesis for which there's no real evidence, it's impossible to give any actual dates. But as a generalization, we can say that the source of the Near Eastern stimulus ought to have been writing from around the middle of the second millennium BC. That allows several centuries for the diffusion process to work as it, as it is presumed to work. By the middle of the second millennium BC, glottographic writing in both Egypt and Mesopotamia had been around for more than 1500 years and writing used to represent grammatically complete sentences, uh, that is identifiably language specific writing, had been around for more than a thousand years. Writing had developed to a level where the distinction among logographs and syllabographs and individual letters, non-phonetic determinatives was standard, conventional, and fully represented in the major writing systems of the area. If this were the source of the stimulus for the invention of Chinese writing, we would expect to find a Chinese writing system that reflected most, if not all, of these features. But we don't. What we find in the earliest known Chinese writing is a writing system that can be shown to be not far removed from its inception. So uh, in the remaining time that I have, I'd like to sketch out uh, the stages of the early development of Chinese writing in order to illustrate what I mean. And I use the word stages again with that kind of scare quotes on it. Um, talking about it in, in terms of stages is a bit artificial since the so-called stages were, except for the initial stage, very likely to have overlapped to the point where they were more or less all going on at the same time. Chinese writing, like all writing systems that emerge ex nihilo, with the qualification on the ex nihilo claim that I mentioned earlier, started out life with graphs that were plus P plus S. These graphs were in origin iconic representations of the things they uh, referred to by the words that they wrote. I would characterize this initial step by the label iconicity. On the slide here, I've given uh, a few examples of this from the early Chinese case. The first graph that you see there shows how the word modern Chinese pronounced he, for growing grain uh, is written with a graph that was presumably in origin an image of a stalk of growing grain. We can call this an iconic usage, but notice one important thing. If we did not know that this graph stood for the word he, the word he, meaning growing grain, we probably would not see it as an iconic representation of a stalk of growing grain. And yet knowing the word that it writes, we can with a little bit of, maybe we should call it charitable imagination, see it as in origin iconic. And that is exactly what we would expect 
graphs in a glottographic writing system, irrespective of their origin, convey information by standing for words, not things. The evidence of early writing systems everywhere suggests that this step was pretty much the same wherever writing arose. The Egyptian hieroglyphs, protocuneiform graphs are often iconographically more readily identifiable than the Chinese, but all of them, when they are functioning as writing, stand for words, not things. Whether the iconicity is still transparent or camouflaged or completely gone, doesn't matter. If they're part of a glottographic writing system, they stand for uh, words and the meaning is conveyed by the word. Okay, so here are three examples of the character for growing grain. The second one is the uh, 1200 BC form of the graph that stands for the modern Chinese word new, meaning woman. And the third one, same thing, 1200 BC roughly, a uh, form of the graph that stands for the modern Chinese word ko that means mouth uh, or orifice. And I, I hope the way I've sketched it out on this graph is clear. I mark them in origin as minus p. This is gonna be, that's, that's, what, I, that's what I mean by these marks. This is the pre glottographic pre-phoneticization stage. We don't have any archeological evidence of that. It's only inferred on the basis of this kind of information. They become phonetic, modern Chinese. Uh, I've put the old Chinese here for no particular reason other than, well, it will become important in a minute uh, in one particular respect, but mostly it's to remind everyone that languages change, including Chinese in their pronunciation and this represents the best efforts of the historical phonologists to come up with some uh, sound system for the language, probably not as old as 1200 BC, but as old as the data allow you to, to reconstruct. In any case, it won't play a strong role in anything that we're gonna talk about. It's just there to remind you that we're talking about approximately a 3000 year uh, developmental trajectory. Okay, now everyone knows that graphs such as these alone will not make any kind of writing system. You need more. The second step uh, is, or stage is to recognize that the graphs that have been, uh, that have arisen iconographically at the, at the initial stage can be used photographically with either phonetic or semantic values beyond what they initially had. This is what is called a multivalent stage of the development of a writing system. And it seemed to have occurred in all four cases of the invention of writing in antiquity. Specifically, graphs can be exploited in two ways to further the versatility of the embryonic writing system. The first is what is commonly called the rebus method of writing. This is familiar to everyone from children's books. This is what I put on the, uh, on the slide here. The simple operative principle is that based on its pronunciation, a graph can be used to write a homophonous or nearly homophonous word that has no semantic link to the word originally written with the graph in question. Formally, this can be represented as uh, on the slide here, G plus P, and then I put plus S sub one. S sub one means a semantic value different from the original semantic value when the graph was standing uh, iconically. Uh, that could be, if you want, you could call that S sub zero, the zero being uh, for O original. Don't have to do that. In any case, uh, the P value is the phonetic value of the graph and that remains fixed, doesn't change. That's the anchor to the, to the graph uh, that allows the phonetic value to change, um, sorry, that allows the semantic value to change uh, that means that the graph with the same pronunciation can be used to write a semantically different word. It's the pronunciation that the graph gives you. Uh, <clears throat> for Chinese, this is called phonetically based extended usage. Here are the same three characters, the same three graphs from the Shang inscription writing system uh, as they were used multivalently, that is uh, with what I call phonetically based extended usages. That just is a fancy way of saying they're being used as rebuses. 
the graph originally for the growing grain was pronounced ch, Old Chinese like this, and it's used in rebus fashion for the homophonous word harmony. You can write the word harmony with this graph simply because these are simply the modern form of the characters I put there just for convenience, uh, because the pronunciations are the same. The same thing applies mutatis mutandis to the graph for woman. Uh, it's used for a nearly homophonous, not exactly homophonous, but close uh, old Chinese pronunciation for the verb to approach or to draw near to. The old Chinese for the new, for the woman was pronounced like this. It comes out reconstructed as NRA, a somewhat infelicitous reconstruction in these days in this country, but there you have it. The verb for approach or draw near is simply NA, a slightly variant form uh, of the syllable. And the same thing applies to the graph for uh, the mouth. It's used for the semantically completely unrelated word ko, which means to strike or to attack, uh, simply because the pronunciation fits. The second way that graphs are used multivalently is to keep the semantic value fixed and allow the phonetic value to vary. It's simply the counterpart to what we just talked about. Here's a, a fanciful example of what I mean by this. If you read this sentence, I heart New York, you're reading the, the, the heart graph iconographically because it looks like a heart. So you can read it, I heart New York, and this is taking the, the red graph in the middle there as an iconograph. If you read it, I love New York, which my guess is, is the intended reading. Um, if you read it as I love New York, then you're using, you're understanding the heart graph in a multivalent that is a, with a semantically um, similar meaning, but with a completely different pronunciation. This is what can be called indexical. This is index, the generalization is indexicality. The pronunciation uh, is unrelated to the pronunciation that the graph has in its iconic form, but clearly based on the semantic association um, <clears throat> of the graph that the, uh, of the word that the graph originally stands for. This is what the 19th century American philosopher and semasiologist Charles Sanders Peirce called an indexical use of a sign. The sign graphically points to a meaning but is not an iconographic representation of that word. In our terms, it means that the semantic value of the sign remains fixed, while the phonetic value is allowed to vary. Formally, then it's G, and you have to write P sub one for the changed phonetic value. That's the difference between the pronunciation heart and the pronunciation love, uh, completely unrelated words, but sh the same underlying semantic value, one, uh, is, uh, gives rise to the, in, is an index uh, for the other. This kind of thing happened in the development of all of the writing systems in, of antiquity. Here are the example, here's one example that we talked about already in connection with iconic and phonetically extended usages. Now you have the same graph for the growing grain, the grain stalk. Now it's being used indexically three different ways in this case. The growing grain, this is the non-phonetic, this is the pre-glottographic word. I still put it there to remind you that this, that this must have had that sense at some pre-glottographic stage. And it gains the phonetic value, but now it's taking on the phonetic value. Modern Chinese would be nian, old Chinese would be this, and it means harvest or agricultural year. The relation between the two should be clear. It's also used to write another word unrelated lexically to either he growing grain or nian harvest. It's used to write the word xiao, which is <clears throat> old Chinese this, has no relation to the other words, but semantically it follows from the uh, underlying iconic sense of the growing grain, namely a field of ripened or flourishing uh, grain. The third thing, the third word that it's used to write uh, indexically is the seasonal term autumn. 
And uh, again, the connection between autumn and harvests and growing grain uh, it ought to be semantically straightforward. And uh, this character was used to write all three of these words. In some cases, in the case of Nien, this is attested in texts. In the other cases, it's inferred from usages and occurrences in the later writing system. Uh, I, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll see, and I'll show you what I, how we can infer that in just a minute. Multivalent usages, Oh, here are, multi, here are indexical uses of the other two uh, graphs that we've been talking about. The word for woman, uh, the graph stands for new, but it also stands for the word stable because iconically it's understood as uh, a kneeling seated person and it carries the semantic sense of settled, sitting, stable, and so forth. And it comes to be used, and again, this is attested in texts. It's not uh, just inferred. Um, for the word on, which means basically that, settled, stable, secure, and so forth. The graph for mouth is used for the semantically related verb to call, uh, pronounced Ming. The pronunciation has nothing to do with the pronunciation that the graph had when it stood for the noun mouth, but the meaning is essentially an indexical extension uh, of, of the graph for mouth. So multivalent usages, both semantic and phonetic, inevitably entail ambiguity. When we see a graph for the grain stalk, the question is, is it writing he grain? Uh, is it writing he harmony? Is it writing nian for harvest? And so forth. The same kind of question arises for all cases of multivalent usage. Most of the time, the context will probably make it clear what the intended word is, but nevertheless, the growing ambiguity that graphic multivalence builds into the expanding writing system seems to have been a concern. And all early writing systems seem to have dealt with the problem pretty much the same way. And that is by adding secondary graphic components to the ambiguous primary graphs in order to specify which of the various possibilities is intended. These secondary graphic components are typically called determinatives, as you all know, because they are used to determine the intended word uh, being written. And this stage of the development of the writing system is called the determinative stage. Determinatives can be either phonetic or semantic. That is, they can specify either a pronunciation or a meaning. In either case, they serve the purpose of disambiguating the uh, graphic usage. So here is a slide showing semantic determinatives. Uh, the ambiguity in, entailed in this graph used to write several different possible words is disambiguated, is removed, if you add something to it, uh, in this case, you add this graph, which is the modern form of the one that we saw a few minutes ago for mouth, but now it's being added uh, without any phonetic value, simply to specify the word harmony instead of the word growing grain. So this character now is unambiguous and it's a compound character, it has two parts, left and right. Same thing as the case down here. If you want to specify that you're writing the word autumn, you add this element, which is the modern Chinese graph for fire, to the uh, right-hand side of the growing grain uh, stalk uh, character. And now you've got a two-part character that stands for the word autumn unambiguously. Uh, by the same token, in the case of the kneeling woman, the kneeling person graph, if you wanna specify that it doesn't mean woman, uh, but that it's standing for the word na or a modern Chinese ru to approach, then you add, again, in this case, you add the same thing. You add the mouth graph uh, onto the woman and you have a two-part character that tells you that this is now the word, standing for the word uh, ru to approach, not for the word new woman, and by the way, not for the word on stable or secure. So in all of these cases, those secondary graphs are determinatives, and in all of the cases, the intended meaning, the intended function is to specify meaning. 
They have nothing to do with the pronunciation of the secondary grass. Different story. Phonetic determinatives do exactly the counterpart or the comparable thing. They specify pronunciation. So now the kneeling woman character is specified as being uh, intended to write the word on by adding a secondary component. Modern Chinese, it looks like this. In origin, it's a component that looks like this. The pronunciation of that component was given here again in Old Chinese. Modern Chinese, it's Han. It sounds a little bit like An, but not quite. Old Chinese, it's the same story. It sounds a little bit like this, but not quite. Close enough for government work. This is the way the writing system worked. So this graph, my cursor seems to come and go, I don't know why. This graph is used now to specify the pronunciation on instead of the pronunciation uh, ru or nu uh, or other possibilities for that character. And again, you get a two-part character. This time the two parts are uh, arranged vertically instead of horizontally. Same thing down here. The graph, when it's intended to write the word Ming to call, is augmented with a second component, which has an underlying pronunciation Ming. And so it's telling you, read this as Ming, don't read it as Ko. Uh, and by the same token down here, the word for year is augmented, is, uh, the graph is supplemented with this character, uh, pronounced Yuan in modern Chinese. In Old Chinese, the pronunciations were fairly close. The difference is between this and this. And the, again, it's a vertical arrangement. And that tells you, read it with this pronunciation. Don't read it as one of the other possibilities. Now, this is the phonetic determinative. And these are the two ways that, writing, that the, uh, all evolving writing systems seem to have dealt with the problem of ambiguity. Uh, or multivalence that arose um, in the initial stages. Up to this point, the most striking feature structurally of Chinese characters was that they were all single graphic units. With the introduction of determinatives, we now have compound characters with two or more components. And the examples that I've shown you uh, all end up being two-part characters, two component characters, but the provision for phonetically based extended usages, that is this kind of usage based on, on a pronunciation similarity or identity, uh, that um, and the addition of secondary determinative, that, that feature of the writing system is recursive. So you could take a two-part character, use it again uh, in a phonetically extended way add a third component to specify the new uh, uh, usage, the word that, the, that, the three part, that a three-part character now stands for, and so forth. In, in, these, in this case, that's not common, but it's certainly common for lots of characters. Um, because of the recursive nature of this feature of the writing system, the, the phonetically extended usage feature, um, uh, you get characters with four or five components. Beyond five, it's not very common, but there's nothing in principle to prevent that. Okay, here's a summary of the stages that I wanted to talk about. Please keep in mind that setting this out in stages is a heuristic convenience. In all likelihood, this doesn't reflect an actual chronological sequence. Except at the initial stage, the processes of multivalent usages and adding determinatives were probably all going on at the same time. <clears throat> okay, at this point, we've come to the stage that accounts for all of the fundamental features, both of the modern Chinese writing system and of the writing system of about 1200 BC. To be sure, there are many subsequent secondary developments and the outward appearance of modern Chinese characters is of course very different from that of the early inscription forms. But the structural features of the writing system uh, today are fundamentally the same as those of the Shang inscriptions, 1200 BC, so more than 3000 years ago. Okay, now finally, in uh, coming to the uh, close to the end, let's come back to the question, the initial question. What does this brief sketch of the development of Chinese writing tell us about the matter of stimulus diffusion 
and the possibility that it explains the origin of Chinese writing? The answer lies with the step that we called multivalence. Phonetically based multivalence is always possible throughout the life of characters and of the writing system. Characters always have pronunciations. The pronunciations have changed, that's for sure, but by definition, characters have some pronunciation. So phonetically based multivalence, that so-called rebus usage, is always possible. It goes on even today in modern Chinese as the basis for creating written forms for new words, borrowed words, scientific terms, and so forth. So the fact of phonetically based multivalence in the Shang writing system of around 1200 BC does not tell us anything about the stage of development that it represents. But semantically based multivalence, what we were call, uh, calling following purse indexicality is a different matter. Indexical usage is only possible when the iconicity of the original graph is still viable enough to be semantically suggestive. That is to say, the semantic value of a graph is attached to the iconic form uh, only at the moment of the origin of the character. As soon as the character becomes the conventional way to write a given word, meaning is conveyed by the word, which means by the word's pronunciation. Graphic iconicity becomes less and less central and less and less pertinent to the character's functioning in the writing system. The indexical use of a graph entails, by definition, setting aside the graph's pronunciation and using it to write a phonetically unrelated word based on meaning, not pronunciation. And the only place the meaning can come from, if it doesn't come from the pronunciation, is the iconicity of the graph. Once iconicity is lost, indexical multivalence is no longer possible. So in the example that we looked at a few minutes ago, the only basis for using the graph shown here, iconically the growing grain stalk graph, for these other words, nian uh, for a year, uh, xiu for flourishing, and xiu for autumn, the only basis uh, <clears throat> for using that graph for, to write these words is that the iconic quality of the graph is still viable enough of these two graphs that we talked about being used in an indexical way. Index, uh, iconicity as a feature of the characters is lost very early in the development of the script because when characters are recognized as standing for words, which is the basic nature of the Chinese writing system as it is for all writing systems, uh, glottographic writing, meaning is conveyed by words. It's no longer necessary to rely on any iconic power of a character. So this kind of multivalence is only possible at an early stage of the development of a writing system. As things evolve, it becomes non-functional. And those cases that arose become obscured by the inevitable addition of determinatives. The addition of determinatives to phonetically based extended usages, uh, this kind of thing, leaves the mechanism of that kind of multivalence completely identifiable because the pronunciation of the new compound character is the same as or very close to the pronunciation of one of its components. But the addition in, uh, of determinatives to indexical usages, these, these two examples that we talked about a minute ago, effectively erases all traces of that kind of multivalence <clears throat> because the iconicity of the original character is long gone. What you end up in the, in the functioning writing system are things that look like this and that look like this. There's no role, iconicity has no role in any of that or in any of the earlier forms. Um, in the everyday functioning, even of the 1200 BC uh, Chinese writing system, iconicity is identifiable in some cases, but it doesn't have any, any central role to play because that's a glottographic writing system. <clears throat> so because the iconicity of the original character is long gone, there's no recognizable graphic motivation for the compound character. 
The fact that we can identify indexical usages in the writing system of around 1200 BC means that some measure of latent iconicity it was still viable and the script therefore is likely not far removed from the time of its first appearance. By the same token, it's close to two millennia later than the comparable stage of writing in the ancient Near East. So given that writing in the ancient Near East by the middle of the second millennium BC was structurally very different from what we find in China at the moment of the ostensible impact of the phenomenon of stimulus diffusion, the only writing that could have constituted the source uh, of the stimulus for Chinese writing, given what we know of its structure, is a, a form of writing that was uh, 2000 years earlier in the ancient Near East. And it seems to me unlikely that any kind of stimulus diffusion effect would have taken 2000 years to show up. The alternative has to be, as far as I can see, to recognize the Chinese writing in all likelihood arose independently of any other writing in the ancient world. And therefore we have to accept the conclusion of polygenesis for the emergence of writing uh, in human civilization. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much uh, for that really interesting lecture, um, especially for those of us who don't know much about um, the Chinese writing system. Um, I think we've got a couple questions in the chat and um, I'm happy to entertain some more and pass them on to Dr. Boltz. Um, Sid Fox had a question about the relationship, if there is any, um, between um, what he calls art and oral composition um, in early writing systems, perhaps I suppose in in the Chinese case would be most um, salient to, for you to answer that question, I suppose. Is there a relationship between oh, um, art and? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure there is. Uh, um, I'm not, I, I'm certainly not a, um, anything but an amateur when it comes to art and art history. Uh, as you know yourself from among other things, the publications in that book on agency on uh, the article by Wang Hai Chung uh, and his teacher at Princeton, Bob Bagley, uh, there's a good deal of relation between the art as it's reflected in uh, contemporary and in, in bronze inscriptions and bronze um, uh, vessels that are contemporaneous with the Shang writing system. The bronzes uh, are come of course earlier than, than writing. There is a, a huge um, inventory of uh, very high, highly high quality uh, bronze, and bronze vessels dating from a period before, the attest, uh, before any attested evidence of Chinese writing. And the relation between that, those two things is, is certainly important, it's certainly pertinent. Uh, there's one respect in particular with respect to Chinese bronzes that may eventually turn out to be uh, a source for that kind of missing pre-glottographic marking system. Uh, right now, the archeological record doesn't show anything, but there are features of those bronze inscriptions contemporaneous with the Shang uh, so-called Oracle Bun inscriptions that ha have a, uh, certainly have a relation to the earliest Chinese writing and yet have an extremely uh, easily discernible, elegant artistic aspect to them. And Professor Bob Bagley at Princeton and and his student Wang Hai Chung and other people, of course, have studied that. Uh, most recently, I heard a talk by John Baines, uh, who's the, now the emeritus Egyptologist from Oxford, who uh, got interested about 20 years ago in comparing early Egyptian, the, con the context in which Egyptian writing arose and the context in which Chinese writing arose. And he gave a talk uh, just a few months ago in Bologna, uh, which I heard through Zoom. Sorry to say I didn't get to go to Bologna to hear it myself. In any case, uh, he, he was explicitly drawing comparisons between the relation, just exactly this question, the relation between the art historical context and the origin of writing. And, and that's important uh, and certainly a, a valid um, consideration. 
And it becomes, I, say, I think, especially important in the Mesoamerican case, um, uh, where, I, where I have no expertise at all, but I think the work, uh, the earlier work, I'm not sure what she's doing now, but 20 years ago or slightly more, Elizabeth Boone uh, talked a great deal about the um, appearance of Mesoamerican writing and the, and the uh, art historical or, or artistic context in which that occurred. Um, and that's also a very valid and important thing. You have to be a little bit careful to distinguish between all of the aspects of the art and uh, the cultural features of that and writing in a glottographic sense. This is one of the reasons that I pinned that adjective on writing to talk about it the way I've talked about it. Uh, the difference doesn't mean that one is more important or less important than the other. It simply means there's a difference and that difference had a great deal to do with how things turned out. Uh, in his review of Elizabeth Boone's book, David Stewart, made that point very politely, but all the same very clearly, that you have to keep this distinction in mind or, or else things get confused in a way that doesn't really help the situation. Um, okay, that's a, a long and very vague answer. And that's because I don't know anything very specific. Please excuse me. I can add the reference um, to, the, uh, to the paper in um, Agency and Early Writing in the in the uh, Q&A, if that's interesting to, um, to Sid. Um, another question by David Mora Marine is, in the more recent history of Chinese writing, that is to say the past couple of centuries, has iconicity and indexicalization, um, parentheses multivalence, has that been exploited by authors for the development of new signs? The that was also a question I had too about like, yeah, new signs um, coming in from outside, like how, how would those? Yeah. Uh, yeah, certainly multivalence comes in two flavors. Uh, phonetic, and these are what I call, these are the rebus usages. Technical term that I gave that is phonetically extended <clears throat> usages. You use a character based on its pronunciation to write a new word or another word or a different word or an invented word, uh, whatever it is. That goes on all the time because characters always have pronunciations. They have pronunciations now they had pronunciations yesterday and they will always have pronunciations because that's what a writing system does. And so that, the answer is yeah, the, those, that particular uh, kind of multivalence is exploited automatically. I mean, it becomes a, a basic feature of the writing system. It's the same thing as, as the uh, heart business. But indexicality that is based on uh, uh, allowing the semantic value to maintain uh, stability and allowing the phonetic value to change, that can only occur at the earliest stage of the writing system because that depends on the semantic um, component that the, that the iconographic value of the character gives. And there are no, an iconography plays no fundamental role in, the, in Chinese writing for the last 2,900 years. Um, that is to say, that's lost. That's, that's the main reason that I don't think, uh, that I do think that what you find in the 1200 BC Shang period inscription material is not very far removed from the earliest stages of the writing system. Um, so you have to distinguish between, between phonetic multivalence and semantic multivalence. Phonetic multivalence, that is rebus writing, goes on all the time. Yeah, so the answer is yes. New words, uh, borrowed words, what we do in English, relying on Greek and Latin to make up funny words to stand for new over-the-counter drugs and, and stuff like that that you see advertised uh, uh, on television all the time. The Chinese do that with basically rebus usages, yeah. And have been doing it uh, consistently all along. Great. There's a question too about um, the script of Easter Island, Rongo Rongo, if that might comprise a fifth, um, or are you just focusing on deciphered and verifiably independent script systems? Uh, the latter, that is at least deciphered. That's right. If a script isn't deciphered, it's, it, it's hard to say anything about it. It's hard to, to, to know how to analyze it 
uh, and I claim no knowledge of Rongo Rongo except that it exists. But but you're right. I mean, there are lots of those kinds of writing systems around, and even deciding whether they're writing or not is sometimes an open question. Uh, the classic example of that, and I don't want to offend anybody, but the classic example is what's called the Indus Valley script. And about 20 or so years ago, maybe 25 years ago, um, Richard Sprout, Witzel, and uh, uh, what's the third person's name? Farmer um, wrote a book and uh, wrote an article in which they showed on basically statistical grounds, fairly, fairly rigorous statistical grounds, that it's unlikely that the, in, the so-called Indus Valley script is actually a script at all. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know. I, I'm not talking about any of that. You're right. I'm talking only about the, the, the four writing systems that are known and understood and can be read and deciphered and, and that played important, prolonged uh, historical and cultural roles in human civilization. Right. I was thinking, too, there were some Aegean scripts that, you know, okay. are, are obviously, they seem you know, sui generis, the ones right. I know best, but, right. um, but are also developed in this environment um, wh where writing has a long history, right? That, exactly, that's the difference. And, uh, and I know that this is an area that you know a great deal about, and I've also uh, followed a little bit um, uh, Sylvia Ferrara uh, mm. in regard to these things. And, and that's, a, that's the key difference. Even if they're sui generis in and of themselves, they arose in a context where writing was already known. I mean, writing was not uh, unknown in the Aegean uh, at that time. And so you have to take that into account one way or another. Yeah. Right. There's a question about the, the power and technology element of the oracle bones and how you see the religious, economic, and, um, and the technological playing a role in the development of writing. In the case of, uh, well, I'm no expert in those, in that aspect of those things, or pretty much in any aspect of it, I have to say, uh, but it would be religious, certainly, that you would have to focus on, and, and then the question of power and authority would arise from the religious dimension of the so-called oracle bone inscriptions. Um, it's, a, it, it's an interesting story, but it probably take longer than we have to talk about it. Let me sh just put that back there, because I like these inscriptions. If I could, there, uh, you find this is the bottom side of the plastron, this is the top side. Uh, in a nutshell, these were used in a, in a, in a sacrificial um, ceremony that was intended to show that the king, and king is a legitimate term in the case of the Shang state, there's no reason not to call the, the, the top dog a king, to show that the king was in contact with the ancestors. And the way that was shown was by carrying out a divination ceremony in which uh, some topic is proposed and, uh, and then the, the ceremony entails cracking the shell and the king is presumably um, a, able to read the cracks and discern from looking at the cracks on the shell what the ancestors are responding, how they're responding, what their answer is. Now, that, that's a very simple picture of how it worked, um, but the underlying uh, motive, as I think most Shang historians would agree, is to establish and, uh, and reaffirm the king's ability to be in contact with the ancestors. So there's power involved because that gives him authority over the rest of the people. It's a religious element, or at least it can be a religious uh, phenomenon, depending on how you define religion, because it involves communication between the living world and the, uh, the ancestors, which is basically uh, the world of the, of the departed, and so forth. Um, and, and there are two features that I'll mention, and then I won't say any more because uh, it probably take us too far afield. One of the important features about these inscriptions is uh, they're not questions. It's commonly misunderstood that the, the ceremony entailed asking a question of the ancestors. You know, will the stock market go up tomorrow and should I invest in ABC company? And the ancestor right, responds and says, yeah, buy today or something like that. That's not the way it works. 
they're not, there are no questions there. Grammatically, these are not questions. Grammatically, there's a statement on this side, which is a phrased usually in a positive mode, an affirmative mode. This particular one happens to say, uh, we will receive a rich harvest of millet. On this side, the same proposition is posed in the negative. On this side, it says, we will probably or maybe or perhaps not receive um, a, good a good millet harvest. So there are two statements. And, and those are not written on the plastron until long after the ceremony is over. They're presumably spoken, and they're probably spoken in some kind of ceremonial way out loud at the time of the ceremony. And then also at the time of the ceremony, the shell has been prepared in advance, and somebody, an assistant uh, to the king, presumably, somebody who has some kind of authority and power, uh, takes a hot object of some kind, plunges it into these gouges. These, as I said a minute ago, are basically hollows in the shell that are designed to make the, the shell very thin at that point. So when you stick a hot object into it, it cracks. And, uh, and when it cracks, it produces on the other side, back, uh, back on this side, it produces a set of cracks. You have to distinguish between the natural original cracks, which are these strong white lines. This, this of course, is a rubbing uh, of the original uh, shell. And the cracks that my cursor comes and goes, I don't understand why. Uh, there it is back again. You, you see a crack here with a vertical line and then a line that goes like this. Same thing down here, same thing down here. And you see matching cracks on these side of the same kind of thing. Those are the cracks that have been in, uh, instilled by plunging the hot object on the other side. Just exactly at this point where the two lines come together, it corresponds exactly to the pits that have been gouged out here. And the fact that they're gouged out vertically with then this kind of bulge towards the center is precisely what produces that shaped crack. That's what you do during the ceremony. Then the king presumably looks at, this is all inferential, this is all speculative, of course. There were no, there were no YouTube videos of how it actually worked. Then the king looks at this and then he says, ah, I see, it means we will have a good harvest. That's what this says over here. This is the only inscription on the back side, uh, as far as I can see. And it says that the king read the cracks on the other side and said, auspicious. And then probably, that's broken off here, there's, a, there's part of an inscription that goes down here, and most of it is missing here. Uh, but it probably says, it probably repeats the proposition, we will have a successful millet harvest. Now, that is both a, a religious practice, uh, a religious performance, and an assertion of power through the king's ability, still a, a successful ability to communicate with the ancestors. By the way, I should mention that uh, uh, inscriptions in which it says the king read the inscription and said yes are not rare, but most of these things don't have any inscription at all as to what the king actually decided. And I've never seen one, and I think that the, the specialists in this field agree, you never find one where it said the king was wrong. Um, you, simply don't, you simply don't say that. Uh, the king is never wrong. Okay. So then after the whole thing is over, then the inscription is cut onto the plastron and it's put away in some kind of archival sense, presumably as a record of the fact that we performed this divination and, and probably the uh, divinations were, were required to be performed according to some kind of schedule, um, having to do with the most recently departed ancestor and so forth. So then it's archived and the fact that it was archived is what's responsible for the fact that uh, about 120, approximately 120 years ago, uh, f farmers and, and people in North China started finding these things in their fields. And then uh, a short while later, scholars recognized what they were. Um, the archeological excavations in Anyang, that's where their red X was on my slide, began shortly after that. 
and this whole thou there there are thousands of pieces. Most of these, by far, come out in pieces. The fact that this is an intact plastron is remarkable, but it's also what makes it nice to show. So there is a dimension to that, um, uh, that that's probably very interesting for people who actually know a lot about it. Great. I think we have um, 10.30 is when we're switching over to the next speaker. So maybe there's time for one more question, um, which was a question about the relationship between iconic um, counting systems and the origin of writing. Uh, it's probably, it, it seems reasonable to suppose that uh, the marks that you use in a counting system would, would be one of the first places that you would find graphs phoneticized. Uh, so my, my guess is, and I, you can't prove it as far as I know anyway, uh, but it, my guess is that that the numbers, probably the number of the stuff that I showed, the numbers on the left-hand side of the proto-hieroglyphic tags from Abydos show what look like numbers. You can't prove they're numbers, but it certainly looks like numbers. They're just marks, like keeping track of your score in a, in a, in a card game of some kind. And it, it seems very likely that that would be one of the first places that you would find phoneticization. As soon as the graph is conventionally associated with a particular pronunciation, in English, one, two, three, and so forth, then it becomes writing. Um, if it's, if it's uh, not phoneticized explicitly and is used, say, one or first or primary or primus or something like that, that's still writing, but it's not glottographic. It's now uh, a kind of a, a graph in a non-phonetic marking system but still has, of course, very important usages. And it's precisely the kind of thing that could give rise to the phoneticization of the graph. That's, that's what I suspect happened in all of these cases. Yeah, I think that's a, a very likely place to find that happening. There are, by the way, numbers here on this plastron. If you see this little mark here, that's the number one. You see there are two of those little marks, that's the number two. Guess what? Three of those little marks, that's the number three. Four of those little marks, that's the number four. The one, two, and three are the same way you write the same things in Chinese today. Number four is not written with four strokes. And, and the higher numbers are not written with just increased numbers of strokes. Nevertheless, that's an obvious way to write numbers. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're counting the cracks. You see the same numbers over here. One, two, three, four for the matching cracks over here. Last thing I'll say, and then, and then we can turn it over to the next speaker. Um, the last thing I'll say is another feature of this that's art, from an art historical point of view that's interesting is the symmetry. The, the cracks are symmetrical, the inscriptions are symmetrical, um, the plastron is probably chosen because of its symmetry, and that probably is important. It's, it's not, I, I mean, it, you can, it's open to your imagination to decide how it's important or what the implications are. But at least it's important. There is a, a professor in Paris um, uh, by the name of uh, uh, Olivier Ventur, who wrote his dissertation on this aspect of the oracle bone inscriptions and, and, uh, and did an extremely interesting job of, of analyzing the relation between the writing and the symmetry and other physical features of the medium. One of the important things to, has to be recognized with early Chinese writing is you can't divorce it from the medium. Uh, it's all part of, uh, of the same package. This is one of the points that Wang Haicheng makes in his papers from time to time because his teacher, uh, Bob Bagley, has emphasized this a great deal. Yeah. Okay, thank you all very much. It has been a pleasure. I look forward to the uh, rest of the papers. <laughs>